Today, I'm taking on an incredibly ambitious challenge in Europa Universalis 4. I want to unify Japan, but not in the way you've seen hundreds of times before. Not as the Shogun, not as one of the Daimyo, but as Korea. This task is extremely difficult. As an external country outside the Shogunate, I'll have to face the powerful Japanese army and navy. But those aren't the only challenges. Japan is an island, so no allies will come to my aid in wars. Each and every province could bring 30 years of rebellion, including religious uprisings. However, I know that combining the strongest traits of Japan and Korea will be worth it. Because this will allow me to create the strongest nation for development in this game, as long as I manage to achieve all the advancements I've planned. What strategies will I use to reach this goal? Goal. Find out for yourselves. Welcome imperialists. Lucas here. In the beginning, I'll spend the first 20 years focusing on developing Korea's provinces. The reason is very simple. To the north, I have hordes that I could conquer, but it wouldn't yield much benefit. To the west, I face the mighty Ming and its army. Moreover, Ming is currently my overlord. And to the east, there's the powerful Japan, as mentioned earlier. Japan has an even stronger army than Ming, at least until it unites. So I'll make use of the fact that I have an incredibly powerful ruler, who with a really cool third bonus a really strong Korean government form. Cheaper advisors and faster development are always good bonuses. Korea's economy isn't bad either. That's why I've taken the following basic privileges. For the clergy, accelerated religious harmonization is very important. Rapid harmonization is crucial for me because with high harmonization, my development costs decrease as well. I'll leave room for the development of temples privilege for the clergy later. Before I take it, I'll need to reclaim some land. Then I'll disable army maintenance as I don't plan on waging wars. However, from experience, I won't disable the northern fort on the border. I'll dismantle the southern fortifications though. I've hired advisors and my heir had a very unfortunate accident. By the way, it's worth getting rid of him because Korea has a nice form of government that guarantees good heirs, usually. My only rival is Jian Zhou. In hindsight, I could have attacked a horde first and then focused on development. I also adopted a few cool reforms. In fact, I took all of them. I sent the trade fleet to protect against pirates in Nippon as that island will soon become a pirate republic. For the naval doctrine, I chose Korea's unique one. I sent a diplomat to improve relations with the Chinese emperor and to build a spy network in Jianzhou in case of war. Honestly, I'm not looking for any allies because I don't want to get entangled in any internal wars here. And allies would be useless for the conquest of Japan anyway. Also, I'm changing my court's stance to military. Shortly after, I was informed of rising tensions among the peasantry in my country. If I don't act, there will be a rebellion soon. To prevent it, I had to complete this mission before 1470. Honestly, I don't necessarily want to do it this time, but you'll find out why later. Unless it becomes very troublesome during my conquest of Japan, then I'll take care of it. In this province, I decided to allow foreign merchants as it will lower development costs. Oh, autonomy! I forgot that due to some historical events, we now have a baseline increase in autonomy in Korea. So I immediately reduce it. I also increase stability to the first level as quickly as possible. I don't need any more than that. With positive stability, my provinces start to prosper. The better my ruler, the faster they prosper. And prosperous provinces mean powerful bonuses for both the economy and development. Remember when I mentioned a powerful event for my ruler? This is it. And look at the air I get. Totally worth it. The rest aren't that great. Boo! Korea wants to develop technology as fast as possible to gain innovation points. Shortly after, I managed to implement all three technologies as the first country in the world. Innovation is important because when maxed out, it increases all power costs, which is one of the strongest modifiers for development. As for ideas, Korea's first choice is the aristocratic ideas, as they provide quick access to reduced development costs. When it came to developing provinces, I focused first on those at lower levels to reach level 6 there as quickly as possible. I didn't realize how challenging the peasant rebellion would be, and soon after, as you can see, I could already complete both missions, but not just yet. Six more years. In 1465, I could change my focus to something else. But for now, I've decided to keep it since I'm almost ready for war with Japan. Almost, because I still don't have a well-developed fleet, which I need to expand to roughly this size. This will grant me an admiral and territorial claims. I just sent spies to Japan. To speed things up, I'm taking additional loans. Unfortunately, the invasion of Japan will be led by the Bu, the first Yi. Before the invasion, I took the justification of my wars, which reduces aggressive expansion. Unfortunately, I'm somewhat overspending on my fleet right now, but it's practically unavoidable. Avoidable. However, I have cash reserves, mainly from land sales. After a few years, I've managed to prepare the invasion fleet. The admiral isn't that great. I'll just change my state's focus to conquest. The army is ready. Some generals are in place. The fleet is sailing out too. It's time for war, and the goal is to capture this island. That's where those pesky pirates are.
Although the Japanese army is currently twice the size of mine, their fleet is roughly comparable. At first, I'll focus on naval operations to send their fleet to the bottom of the sea. A great clash occurred with the Shogun's fleet itself, but their fleet consists mostly of transport ships. Their warships went down. For some reason, the Japanese fleet decided to blockade my coastline, making them an easy target for my massive fleet. I arrive at the spot, and there aren't even any admirals. I send everything to the bottom. No way, they actually split their fleet and are stationed along my coastline. Yeah, they're probably blockading me. On one hand, it's bad because they're raiding and devastating my coastal provinces. On the other hand, it's good because their fleets are now an incredibly easy target for me. I began the invasion by landing on Suo. I'm winning, despite the penalty for a naval landing. Meanwhile, the Japanese army has grown a bit, but not by much. Their fleet, on the other hand, has lost about half its strength and I haven't lost a single ship. The island of Suo fell and now a much harder challenge awaits. I need to establish a foothold on the larger Japanese islands. I am attempting an invasion on northern Kyushu and storming the fortress in Hakata. The troops are ready, but I don't have enough military points. Oops, bombardment, assault. With each assault progress, I consolidate my army to keep it as strong as possible while they're fighting and assaulting. The fortress fell quickly, but the Japanese forces began moving in my direction. I still need to capture this province, which will allow me to block the straits. Overlord sends military mission. In light of our current war with our overlord's rival, the shogunate of Ashikaga, we have been sent a military mission and a contingent of replacement troops to aid us in our efforts. Honestly, I didn't expect such help from Ming, I didn't even know this was possible. Nonetheless, I've managed to secure Kyushu. Just to be safe, I'm scorching the land near the straits as well. This will slow down the Japanese army crossing the strait, and I split my forces to target the capitals of smaller lords. Unfortunately, a Japanese counteroffensive and landing occurred in the meantime. Oh, they're retreating already. Oh. On the second attempt, however, I caught that landing fleet. Peasant upheaval in Korea, yes, that dreaded rebellion I mentioned before. The rural poor have been struggling in recent times. Not only are they taxed far beyond their capacity to pay and still support themselves, but if they flee the land to escape tax obligations, these are transferred to their kin, who remain behind, leading to even greater tax burdens. Yes, it's time to improve the peasant's plight. These modifiers aren't too severe. It turned out I can still complete those two missions, with the second one simply removing the negative modifier. After occupying all of Kyushu, I'll now provoke the Japanese forces to cross the strait, then trap and crush them in battle. Granted, a few too many made it across, but I still have a technological advantage, so I easily defeat the Japanese army. As I'm close to winning the battle, I pull back my fleet, win the battle, and immediately blockade the strait. This triggers another battle right away, I pull back my fleet and gain more war score, I repeat this over and over until the total annihilation of their army giving me even more war score. I've literally destroyed half of Japan's army here. Later, I managed to shatter additional armies of smaller daimyo, whom I allowed onto this island again. I captured the fortresses in the north, then shattered several smaller armies that fell into my trap. I finally cut off the Japanese forces on Shikoku and Tokyoto. Now, it's time to make peace with Japan, but not the kind you might expect. Most of you would probably seize the provinces we have claims on. Precisely those claims, but that would be a big mistake. I wouldn't have an efficient way to shorten the truce period with the Japanese Shogun, meaning another war would only be possible in 15 years and likely 6 more times after that. A much more effective way to conquer Japan is as follows. I capture Kyoto and all existing Japanese fortresses. Oh, the Chinese withdrew their troops. Shame. Kyoto, however, has fallen. I won the war, and in the end, I suffered far fewer losses than I anticipated. Only two ships, the shogunate has been dissolved, Ashikaga no longer has a single vassal, the remaining countries are also no longer vassals. They are free nations that will now start consolidating, and I'll have to conquer them once the truce expires. So at this point, I've established a foothold in Japan, I caused the shogunate to collapse. Now I need to start the process of harmonizing with the Shinto religion, because I don't intend to convert to it. Why? I will tell you when I start the Japanese missions. While harmonization is underway, it's worth completing this mission as it speeds up the process. With the fall of Kyoto, the Japanese shogunate lies in ruins. The Korean troops have entered the city and systematically sacked it. In the process, they have accumulated an incredibly rich hoard of loot, chief among the artifacts taken the chrysanthemum throne, upon which Japanese emperors have sat since the 7th century. King Buddha I has decreed that it shall be taken to the capital. Glory to Korea, which now has territorial claims over the entire Japanese island, so now many conquests lie ahead. Still, my next idea group will be infrastructure ideas, which probably doesn't surprise you. I now also have to deal with a large number of rebellions, which is inevitable and very annoying. I also need to fix my economy because it's in a rough state. So I'm grinding half of my galleys into splinters, I'm writing a popular novel, paying off debt that turned out to be totally unnecessary, changing my court's focus to administrative. Oh, I need to upgrade my advisors to the second level. I lost track. 
Naturally, my advisor died immediately after being upgraded. I'm also stealing maps from Ashikaga to see the entire Japanese island. It's possible that someone might ally with Ainu and seal their fate. And of course, I forgot about the pirates. Yes, at this point, you can write Lucas you fool in the comments, I won't be offended. I'll even leave you a heart. It's very important to immediately suppress any Japanese rebellions, because if they occupy a province, especially one without a fort, separatism will be prolonged, increasing discontent in the province. I now have to monitor where rebellions will erupt and move my troops there as quickly as possible. From what I see, Korea isn't particularly prone to rebellions, so I might even transport all my forces to Japan. More rebellions, more rebellion events. Just when you think you've dealt with all the rebellions, another one pops up. And everyone is slaughtered. As for the provinces that I'll be making into my hardcore, it's only those with the Togoku culture. This is the largest culture in terms of development on the Japanese island, and from what I've seen, it has the best provinces for development. Also, I'll need to switch from my dominant Korean culture to one from the Japanese culture group, otherwise I simply won't be able to form Japan. This will also speed up the conquest of the remaining territories. Meanwhile, I'm building production buildings throughout my country, or temples, wherever they were profitable. Later, there will literally be temples everywhere. Unfortunately, I've generated so many points in the meantime that I had to develop my Korean provinces. This is suboptimal because it means I may need to detach some of these provinces later to adopt the correct Japanese culture. I've prepared my armies for further invasion. Now, now I can add cannons to these armies and I'm doing so in groups of four. I'm also upgrading my government. Fourth level of religious reform. I want harmonization to proceed as quickly as possible. I can still build a decent number of courthouses, although I don't have any immediate shortage in governing capacity. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. My army is ready, fleet as well, ideas almost developed and points accumulated. Alright, I just introduced a new technology, but most importantly, my economy is currently strong enough to support all of this. My next immediate goal will be to conquer the rest of Japan. I start my wars with Wesugi. Lots of provinces with the culture I need. Oh my god, they've built a fortress here. Was it always here? I can change my stance again, but I'm holding off for now. I declare a parallel war on Oda. The troops of free lords stand no chance against me, whether in battle or in the siege of their lands. I immediately begin occupying territory. Oda didn't even budge to counter my smaller armies. Shortly after, I crushed Oda's forces and marched on their capital. Whoa, even better, Oirat has just attacked Ming. Oh wait, no, Ming attacked Oirat. Eh, uh, whatever. During the war with Japan, I harmonized the Shinto religion, which makes my infantry stronger. This will work excellently with the last development to my national ideas. I also invade Shiba. All of Uesugi is wiped out. No major issues in that war. Oda is gone too. Perfectly calculated. I conquered a bit more when I took this part of Japan, but that's good as it lets me suppress rebellions here faster. The downside is all these events that just hang around here for a year without any progress. Yeah, lots of rebellions are coming my way. Wow! I didn't see that coming, but luckily I can break these rebellions quite effectively. Though there are more of them, just no. The worst thing about conquering Japan is the sheer number of rebellions that crop up. It's just an overwhelming number. I hoped Ming would come and clear out these rebels for me, but they seem to have decided against it. If you're wondering why so many rebellions are popping up, it's due to separatism. Every nation that's been here, and there have been a lot, adds a unique pool of separatism in each province. Each one of those shields represents a different type of rebel, and there were dozens of them in Japan. The rise of Neo-Confucianism. Of course, I got the longest possible timer on this event, and now I have to wait for the third Church. Not gonna lie, it would be great to complete that mission before forming Japan. A nice bonus. I quickly crushed the rebellions here, though it wasn't easy, and I suffered heavy losses. Now I have to get back to Japan quickly as another wave is coming. I finished forming the territory. So now I'm making states in eastern Japan with the right culture. Yay! Now, Togoku culture is an accepted culture for me. I'm not hesitating. I'm issuing development edicts on all these provinces to increase the culture's presence by expanding them. I have plenty of diplomatic points and soon I'll be hitting the cap on military points. But before expanding these provinces, I need to conquer the rest. Otherwise, development costs are higher here instead of lower. How did Ashikaga conquer those provinces? When did that happen? Well, guess I'll go conquer Ashikaga then. Where are you running? They have no chance against me. Honestly, I'm finding conquering Japan really enjoyable. I thought it would be much harder. Oh, Shiba, where did you come from? Fortunately, my truce with Yama just ended. I anticipated that, which is why I opted for a five-year peace. Turns out Shiba got a bit bigger. They must have conquered something in the meantime. Yama's army was somewhat tough. Oh, not anymore. Since I'm running low on manpower, I'm recruiting my first mercenary army to clean up the rebels. I'll even take the more expensive one. Boom, boom, boom. Coring 
and now I've conquered more than this part of Japan. After conquering all of Japan, I can't create it as a nation just yet. Changing my culture will be required. And actually, I need to prepare for a double culture change. Just because. I can comfortably switch back to inward focus again. Don't worry. What I'm already coring won't go up in cost. But I can't fully manage this part of Japan just yet. But these rebellions, they're back again. The worst part is that there are more rebels here than there were actual Japanese armies. More rebels. Always a plus, right? At least my generals will get more experienced from this. I've also made some changes to the fortifications in Japan, because they were poorly positioned. I finished my infrastructure ideas pretty quickly, even while conquering all of Japan in the meantime. Am I earning that much? Wow. No, not more rebels, no. I knew this would be the worst part of Japan. Really, it's the worst. I introduced colonialism in the former Oda capital. Or actually, right next to it, since there are dice here. I also made a mix with half mercenary army, half regular army to suppress rebellions, forming groups of 20. This setup works quite well, sparing manpower and effectively suppressing rebellions. After my first annexation of all my provinces, I have to say my country is finally stable. Oh, a daughter was born, that suits me. I introduced colonialism and Ming broke my tributary status. Although maybe I won't attack them. The first purge. Off with his head. I still need two more purges. At this point my empire is approaching the size of Ming, but I'll really spread my wings in about 25 years. Seems like I'm lucky. The reformation era will begin pretty late in about 12 years from now. Okay, Japan is secured and now rebels may still appear here. I also upgraded my advisors for a decent 1.65 cost on level 5. Regarding improving Japan, I'm focusing on the terrain map. I issued edicts everywhere here. Now I'm developing provinces to level 15, but only those with good terrain to keep costs low. Why is this costing so much? Oh right, farmlands here, plains there. For my third idea, I'll choose quality to just have a stronger army. After all, 10% more infantry is no joke, as strange as that sounds. Unfortunately, this is the most boring part to play if you're following in my footsteps. There's no rush in forming Japan now, honestly the bonus seems worth it to wait for. I just have to hold out for the third purge. There's an earthquake in Ming, too bad for them. Meanwhile, urbanization is occurring in my country, though sadly not in the right culture. It dropped. A month before the next era, I trigger Korea's golden era. Let's face it, I won't have the chance to trigger golden era in the next one. Not as a Confucian nation, which just accepts other religions instead of converting them. Finally, I'm burning my administrative development. In this era, you still benefit from the local feudal taxes edict, which boosts your income by 50% through development burn. Yeah, taking the golden era now would have been difficult. Although so maybe it could have been managed somehow. Oh well, maybe you'll do it better. With the funds I gained this way, I'm prioritizing courthouse construction everywhere. Second, I need to build manufactories across Korea, at least that's how I understand the mission. The second literary purge. Equal treatment for everyone. And yes, I have too few revolts, so I'll attack Ming for the mandate of heaven and gain a lot of war participation. That country's in decline anyway. I don't even feel like fighting this war myself. Let the AI handle it. I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm unsure if the mission, which requires manufactories everywhere, includes this building. It's in the manufactory tab, right? Meanwhile, Ming has collapsed. And yeah, I had a hand in that, having attacked them twice for money. Workshop expansion is underway too. Turns out all manufacturers qualify. I just need to build any kind. Now all that's left is to wait for the third purge. By now I have even more land and nearly Togoku as my primary culture. And I think the lowest development level in this region is 15. Finally, the third purge. Wonder if which option I choose matters for my country. At this point, everything's falling perfectly into place. I have a big points reserve, three purges done, and I've met all the requirements for my missions up to the end. Togoku is at 49%, so everything is practically ready to form Japan, which will be my next goal now. So now what I need to do is, first of all, complete all these missions I have. Look, 25 years, reduce construction and development costs. Plus, of course, all the other bonuses I have here, all the way to the glory of Korea. Then I detach this one small area. Thanks to this, Togoku culture becomes my main culture and the form of government disappears. Oh no! Don't click that, just in case, because now is the time to form Japan. Japan has been united, only it was by Korea in this case. And no, I don't want new traditions and ambitions. For what I plan to do and how I intend to play, the ones I have are much better. If I were planning to play differently, I might take the Japanese ones, though. Next, I complete the Edo Jidai mission. There's a hidden 15% development cost here. Then this mission, 10% development cost. And basically, that's it for now. And the last mission is this one. Developing the province administratively means I get two 
development points for the price of one. And now, why didn't I adopt the Shinto religion? Because actually, I'd lose 5% development points, exactly from this mission, where I'd have to go fully into isolationism. Here it shows local development cost minus 5%. But I can only complete this mission after 1600. I could also get 10% development cost during the Japanese urbanization crisis at its end for 50 years. But again, urbanization takes place precisely during global trade. Shinto mission requirements change as well. Here, I'd need a fourth level of isolationism, which would give me that 10 percent development cost. Unfortunately, this excludes the mission that provides all power cost. But if I went into isolationism, I could get that 5% here. The Shinto religion itself has no bonuses to development costs, unlike Confucianism. It can only go into isolationism, which provides another minus 10%. So, in this respect, it's the same as Confucianism. Except Confucianism can first harmonize many religions and, second, benefit from almost all monuments in the world. Another thing worth considering is whether to now re-adopt Korean culture. Because now, without the Korean form of government, we can adopt a privilege called inwards perfection. And it gives us even more reduced development costs the higher the share of the clergy. We can realistically reach a value of 20 to 25% max here. And this will still change over time. The Korean form of government, though, offers a base 15%. So ultimately, the decision is yours, which path you take and what you do. I, however, will add this province to those I manage. I complete literally every mission because it provides incredible bonuses to production. Oh! Now first, I develop the Korean culture province, level 25 development, and I pay 5 development points. This is insane. And right now, I'm building temples everywhere I can. I choose the privilege to dev my provinces, as well as inwards perfection, because it will disappear when I restore the Korean regime. Even mountain provinces, 5 points. Level 21. No, I can't, it barely grows. This Japanese Korea is a powerhouse for devving, out of curiosity. Right now, I have 940 points. I wonder how much I'll have afterwards. Capital at level 33, 6 development points. Look at all these cheap provinces I have. And in hindsight, it just occurred to me that I could have gone fully into monarchist centralized bureaucracy earlier and done double infrastructure expansion everywhere I totally forgot. That's an additional 15%, but I can still do it temporarily now, then reduce the level, since I won't lose development, so let's restore Korean culture now. And the form of government with an additional 5% on development. Level 35 development, 28 points. Wow, tons of modifiers. And a capital with level 35. 11, 40, 20, it's so powerful. Another thing, now I look at building costs. Manufactories for 200 gold, it's almost free. And now I can add all my provinces back to states. I forgot that since I have the infrastructure, I can build two manufacturers at once in each province. And I even have one that reduces governing costs. After a moment, every Korean culture province has at least level 25 development. Those are the more yellowish shades. This makes us truly a green peninsula on the global map. And now, it's time to take on Japan itself. It should be even better here. I'm also curious how much my economy will grow. Since already now it's grown by over 100 gold, and I only gained about 300 development points. I also adopted parliamentarism in Japan. And I remembered correctly, we also get land reform, which reduces development costs by 10%. Besides, I can allocate a lot of provinces to get those bonuses. I literally allocate every single province, at least for now in Korea. Wait, wait, why did it change to show total base tax 350? Someone's gone mad. I developed every province, just from the initial list, to level 15, and I succeeded. The lowest development level in my country is 15, now I'm pushing to 30. 1439 total development, 350 base tax. I really don't know what that's about, but I can do it. At this point, I have 81, and thanks to this, one development increase should give me two development points. Yes, I've never had 100% crown lands in my life. And honestly, I don't know how it's possible with this privilege. The number of modifiers my country has is overwhelming. It's a shame there's no nice way to see all my reduced development costs here since they're all spread out. What's this? No. It actually says primary culture here. How did I miss that? This form of government isn't worth having at all. Well, anyway, it's still worth it to have this government form to ensure a decent successor appears. By the way, I've developed every single province in Korea at this point, every single one, to level 30 or more, level 30 in the mountains, and I'm only paying 29 points. Unbelievable. All of Korea at level 35 development. Wow. Look at Korea, how developed it is. Every single province. The cities here, even in the mountains, even in fortresses. But Japan should be even better, because now I'm switching my government form to Eastern Plutocracy. 
And you know what's better? It's an additional 5% development. Then I need to increase the clergy's share in my government. And inward perfection at 50% gives me 16%. Jesus, my finger hurts from clicking all this development. I got so deved up that I forgot about technology. By developing Korea alone, I've practically overtaken the Ottoman Empire in development. The lowest development level in my country is 25 for now. What? A boom in Korea. Even lower development costs. And throughout the entire region. Amazing. Level 25. Everywhere gets infrastructure. And look, 5 costs. Oh but level 7 reform could really scale nicely with our Korean culture. Ah, and my golden age ended in the year 1566. A little later, I caught up on technology because I was a bit behind. The lowest level of development is 31. Look, I'm making over 400 gold. Wow! I can field an army of 300,000. Manpower growth may not be huge, but that's because I developed Japan. Besides basic buildings, almost all manufactories here are for money. I didn't even bother with manpower builds. And I have to say, Japan itself looks pretty green compared to the rest of the world. World. If you enjoy this kind of content, where we transform a poor region into a very powerful economic kingdom, I recommend this episode with Mali, where, thanks to unique mechanics related to gold mines, I was able to generate astronomical revenue. 